All right, well, good morning. Uh, this is our fourth week of the osteotomy course. These are all the faculty's disclosures, um, none of which are really pertinent to this activity. This is the agenda for the morning. So we're gonna go over proximal uh, femur cases and we're gonna have a 15 minute presentation by me where we're gonna go over a case. Uh, and then we're gonna go out to breakout rooms, which you'll all be automatically uh, dispersed to, um, and you'll have two to three faculty members that will serve as the discussion group leaders, and that will be for 70 minutes. And then we'll come back to this main room uh, for five minutes for a wrap up. Um, and if you can uh, make sure that all of your mics and videos are uh, off for now. So again, I'm Brett Christ, and our uh, faculty are here to help this morning. Uh, so just for Zoom meeting etiquette, uh, everybody should be on mute and uh, their videos off. Uh, there is a dedicated chat if there's some questions. Uh, we're gonna have uh, about the case that I'm presenting. Uh, we'll have a couple minutes to go over that. We'll have some comments from the faculty. Uh, and then if you have specific questions for people, you can specifically ask them. At the end of this session, uh, the learning objectives are to list the indications for proximal femoral deformity correction and non-union management. Utilize deformity correction techniques to restore extra articular alignment and to address non-unions. And so this is gonna be something new for, for most of us that um, have been doing Zoom meetings. Uh, we're gonna to try to do a discussion group uh, in each meeting room and there may be uh, 30 people in one room. And so we're gonna try something different. It may go very smoothly or there may be some bumps, but just be patient and uh, persevere. So this is a, actually a case of a friend of ours um, and he asked for some uh, advice. So this is a 27 year old female who was involved in a motor vehicle crash in 2018 uh, with a left femoral neck fracture and a distal third femoral shaft fracture. She also had a left humerus and a right closed ankle fracture. She presents to him, now he didn't do the initial care, uh, but he presents, she presents to him uh, to address this groin pain and stiffness in her hip when she's walking. So here's the AP pelvis x-ray, which you can see three cannulated screws across the femoral neck fracture. And you can see a definite amount of callus inferiorly. You can see the retrograde nail uh, peeking through at the top there. And you can compare to her contralateral side as far as her CCD angle. And we'll give you those measurements here in a second. So these are some other images, which on this done view uh, lateral, you can see that there may be something uh, a miss with her femoral neck fracture. Here's her standing alignment series uh, for the coronal plane. Uh, there isn't any other really exam information, uh, but this is using the MediCAD software that we showed in that second week. Uh, these are her angles. So in the coronal plane, there's not a significant uh, difference. There's a couple of red angles on both sides, but that's mostly coming from uh, her tibias. Um, there's about a four millimeter uh, leg length discrepancy with the left leg being shorter than the right. Um, and the overall mechanical axis is slightly different, but not significantly. Here's a, I asked him how he could get his text to get this great sagittal plane alignment series. And uh, he said it, it rarely happens that way, but they're able to get it. So that's awesome. And so you can see that her uh, distal femur malunion as well, her distal shaft has about a 10 degree extension deformity, a recurvatum deformity. This is a CT scan uh, showing specifically what her neck looks like. So you can see that there's a significant apex anterior deformity. And this is the rotation profile. So through the neck, there's almost 32 degrees of retroversion. And this is what it looked like from the distal femur as far as her angles that he measured. And he was uh, nice enough to make a 3D model, which I usually don't get the opportunity to see very often. So you can see kind of what the actual deformity looks like. And so the problems that she has are 31, almost 32 degrees of retroversion through the femoral neck. 10 degree extension deformity through her distal shaft fracture. And her main symptoms are groin pain and stiffness in her hip. 
when she walks. And so with that, um, we'll get some thoughts from the panelists. Um, why don't we call on Keith Mayo, see what his thoughts are. Yeah, I think I'd probably want some more information. You know, we, we have a total torsional assessment, but I'm still not sure exactly where that's occurring. So even though it's not the most accurate, I'd probably want to go to a secondary torsion assessment at the level of the lesser trope, because that appears to be normal anatomy. So you can get a side to side comparison to see how much of this malrotation may be in the shaft. Um, so I'd, I'd want to know that first. It's not quite as accurate, but if we know what's happening between the lesser troch and the transcondylar axis, and that's normal, then we just have one problem basically as far as torsion, which is this retro tilt uh, malreduction. Um, uh, and it's, in, in that situation, um, then I definitely would, I would separate these two problems. Um, uh, the distal uh, malunion, the, the hyperextension deformity, I would probably make that less of a priority, although you could certainly do them at the same time. And then in addition to that, she's, I forgot, 18 months out, but um, she's 27, and I think that I'd probably want to try to get some more information without those uh, hopefully titanium can cannulated screws. Yeah, that's and, what they look like to me too. And so I would probably, I mean, rarely do it when I do this, but in this situation I'd either go for, depending on what the institutional capabilities are, I'd want a uh, quote micro uh, a CT angio of the proximal femur or uh, MR angio of the proximal femur, just so I knew where the medial uh, ascending branch was relative to that. And then if I had that information, I'd make my decision about how I would do it. Um, but it looks like it's sort of ideally set up for um, an M. Hauser Weber sort of procedure where you basically take the trochanter off, um, can you make it slot to cannulate it with a blade plate and then come anterior for a seating chisel placement um, because your, your anterior neck is relatively safe. And then um, based on my torsional assessment, we'd have to decide um, whether we were gonna, you're gonna require a intertroch osteotomy um, so that you can basically realign that uh, component in the horizontal plane. So you really don't need much abduction. Uh, if any. And so that's the hard part is basically coming onto the anterior neck for a seating chisel placement and then recannulating the um, uh, trochanteric segment. Or if it doesn't look like you can recannulate it, then you just put it back on it. And the blade is a saddle with screws and tension band wire. So th these are, um, is a very technically difficult case. Obviously, the nail has to come out, but I don't think I. This, would be, this is going to be a long day anyhow. So I would probably pull the nail and think about coming back for the distal femoral um, uh, deformity later on. Um, it would be, or you could theoretically do it in the same hospitalization, which is two different settings, but I personally wouldn't do that to myself or the patient the same day. How about um, Roger? Any other thoughts besides what Keith mentioned? Um, actually, not too much. The Imhauser Weber hadn't occurred to me, which I think is actually a very, very good idea. Um, you know, in somebody who's 27, I'm starting to think about, you know, how perfect I can try to make this again. Um, she's, she's pretty good. She's fairly obese. So it's, you know, everything's going to be a little bit more difficult in that situation. But I do think at age 27, I'm trying to shoot for more perfection. A short of the Imhauser Faber, I don't, I don't think there's much you can do. You could theoretically, you know, if, if all she's suffering from is sort of an extra articular impingement of the place of the greater trochanter, you could theoretically just transfer the greater trochanter. Uh, but I'm kind of leaning towards Keith's idea that the Imhauser Faber, I think that would be sort of the, the best solution for her. 
And could you maybe just uh, summarize that procedure again? Because I don't think there was a, a comment or question about maybe just a little bit more description uh, or just a second go through as far as what that is. Yeah, it's a it's a fairly complicated osteotomy. I mean, it's sort of a it really is kind of a master's level osteotomy. You have to initially do you know a trochanteric osteotomy, so a troch slide or troch osteotomy, make a small window in the greater trochanteric fragment, cut the trochanter fragment off, and then you do a valgus derotational osteotomy of the remaining portion. Uh, so the idea really is to you know, from a simplistic viewpoint, all you have to do at that point is to create a flat surface over the anterior aspect of the neck, about where those screw heads are. Uh, and that will be eventually where your greater trochanter will sit, but it's more on the anterior aspect of the neck. And then, then you cut uh, a transverse wedge and then an oblique wedge on your remaining portion. That'll allow you to derotate uh, the rest of the femur and to tilt up in valgus based on how much valgus you actually want to achieve the remaining portion. But as I was saying, from a simplistic point of view, all you really have to do is get the blade plate seating chisel at the right start point and then into the middle of the head where you actually want to have it. And that'll actually get you to derotate it in the correct way. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but. And then you, you put the trochanter back on in its, in its new location. So it derotates, gives you a little length and transfers the troch. Steve, you have to stop sharing your screen, buddy. I think the other option is, um, depending on what the circulation looks like, um, um, it might be possible uh, to do I wasn't sure about this uh, the first time we looked at it briefly. You might be able to do a basilar anterior closing wedge uh, neck osteotomy as well. Um, that at 30 degrees of correction, that's likely to put a significant amount of tension on your posterior neck circulation, the ascending component. And that's the only reason I, I don't like that idea in particular. I don't think that I think that doing a surgical dislocation with a mobilization of the neck osteotomy um, to reposition it open is probably too high risk. I've never done that. It's been described, but I probably wouldn't recommend it in this situation. It's, it's certainly the most anatomic solution, um, yeah. but it's probably also the highest risk. Right. Because you still have to do the osteoperiosteal flap, right, to do that? Yeah, and and it, and then I think the, the exact the exact placement of your trochanteric osteotomy becomes um, really important um, in that, so that you can basically um, make sure that you can create a full flap. Um, I, I'm sure you can do it, raise the flap. I just don't know. Um, you know, doing a late slip for this, there's a tremendous amount of posterior callus which you have to remove, uh, and that's the, that's the trickiest part of the procedure. I don't see a lot of callus posteriorly here, but that that is an issue. Keith, is right. there any role? Is there any role, Keith, for uh, trying to reduce through the non-union itself? Something that typically I I don't do and have not done, but is there any role for that in order to simplify the procedure? I don't know. Um, it just sort of, it goes back to, I mean, this, this isn't really a slip-like deformity, but it, it, it's the same issues with acute or subacute slips that you run into all the time. Is It depends on how much of a risk of ADN you're willing to accept because um, everything's going to be scarred down posteriorly. So, um, you know, that, that, that's the, I mean, you're going to create, with an or vapor, you create a secondary deformity which when it comes time to convert her to a total hip, uh, you can probably deal with um, a variety of different ways, but um, I don't like it just because of that. I mean, you, you'd be able to correct your uh, torsional problems. What we don't know is uh, from um, the clinicals is what her rotational profile, what her complaints are for sure. So. Uh, I, I think that's going to factor uh, 
hugely into decision making. Yeah, because she definitely is probably impinging on her neck now, yeah. Union, in internal rotation. But hey, Brett, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that um, the my my choice also would be an Imhauser Weber, but the um, the the downside of correcting that correcting the retro tilt or the position of the epiphyseal segment by rotating through the inner trochanteric osteotomy is that you still leave that deformity on the anterior neck that Keith yeah. was talking about. And so, uh, and you actually may potentially dependent upon her, her distal femur as well, you may give her more impingement yep. with that. And so um, the possibility of having to come back and do a debridement after the osteotomy is healed, I think needs to be discussed with the, with the patient. To basically do a neck osteoplasty to try to minimize impingement, you're saying? Yeah, at a later yeah. date, once the osteotomy yeah. is healed. The, the other thing is that um, uh, if you're doing an Imhauser Weber, when, you're, when you are cannulating the, or you're putting the blade through the greater trochanteric fragment, um, if you do that as a, more as a digastric osteotomy, the blade has to find a way to get through the vastus to get back down onto the femur, which it makes it even more complicated. So at least for me, this usually ends up being a, 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 a trochanteric osteotomy that only leaves the abductors attached, but the vastus or a good portion of the vastus ends up coming off. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't do the osteoplasty at the same time though, right? I mean, we, you could theoretically debreed the anterior aspect of the neck because it'll be right there when you, if you're doing the Imhauser Weber. Yeah, I think that you could for, for sure. Um, It'll just depend on, you know, the bone that you're removing may be bone uh, along the anterior aspect of the blade. I would just hate to destabilize my blade tract, but yes, absolutely, it'll be, it'll be there. Yeah, I, I don't really think that she's going to have an impingement issue. I mean, the, the whole point, I mean, I really worry about the metaphyseal deformity here. So if the you put your... Deformity. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. where your osteotomy is, because that was normal anatomy and now longer, it's no longer going to be in the horizontal plane. So if you, if you put your seam chisel on your blade in the center of the neck, and then you correct her. So the biggest issue for impingement, aside from a big cam lesion or something locally at the anterior head neck junction, is really. Um, the rotational arc inflection. And so if you correct that, I wouldn't expect her to impinge at all. So uh, I, I don't know that that's going to be a problem. And I probably would not complicate this by um, trying to do that at the time of surgery. I mean, this is going to be, and, and the other thing is the, the most difficult part of uh, proximal femoral osteotomies is recannulating a trochanter and keeping track of your seating chisel path in the proximal segment, which is now a free uh, piece. And so uh, what you really want to be able to do is keep, keep that motor memory where the seating chisel play, uh, path is. And so I think a lot of times rather than trying to recannulate and completely block your visualization of the old channel, you're probably better off in many cases just creating a slot in the trochanter that will sit on top of the blade after it's put in. And you have to plan okay. that very carefully pre preoperatively. And if you do it that way, then you're back to the same workflow where the blade goes into the, the head neck segment, the trochanter is off, you reattach it to the, to the shaft, and then at the end, you bring it down as a trochanter saddle over the blade plate, shoulder, and then you can fix it with screws and a tension band wire. I think that's a much easier way to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. I think with uh, we're um, getting a little bit behind, so those are great thoughts about the, a very challenging case. And it's this case is a reminder for you guys, and I'll I'll kind of give you more details at the end of how to send your cases in for the participants um, that will need them by Tuesday, and then we'll go over the faculty. We'll go through your a few cases Thursday evening at the Meet the Experts uh, session. And so with that, um, we're going to go through to our discussion cases. And so um, you'll be randomly assigned to breakout rooms and there'll be a, uh, one or two faculty leaders. Um, there'll be two faculty in the room. Uh, one of them is going to present the case and then um, we'll go through kind of your questions and go through your thoughts about the cases, just like you would in a regular small group discussion.
and um, we'll probably just do audio only instead of having a video, uh, but you can try if you want, depending on how many people are in your room. Uh, and then use the chat function if you don't really want to uh, speak up, we can try to answer them with the chat function or at least bring up the point uh, and, and announce it to the group. Um, and then when uh, they, uh, they may need to end up calling on you to speak rather than just speaking so there's not 40 people trying to talk at once. And then at the end uh, of the breakout session, which will be 70 minutes, um, they'll come back to, you'll come back to this room and we'll do a little wrap up and uh, preview for next week. So with that, we'll go to the discussion group. Okay, great. All right, well, why don't we, we'll, we'll have a go at this. Let's take a look at the first case. This is of a proximal femoral malunion. Uh, we're told it's a 62 year old female. One year ago, had a low speed fall while skiing had surgery uh, there and uh, the patient's main complaint is that her leg feels awkward or gait feels awkward. She feels like she in toes uh, and, um, the, and she has pain uh, from uh, the insertion site of her implant, uh, including her proximal thigh and including her knee. View options side by side mode, okay. Uh, I don't see that, Dave. Sorry. Uh, Dave Stephen was offering some solutions. All right, let's see what we got At the here. Top of the screen under view options. You you can see what I'm seeing. I don't see a view options. All right. All right. So this is the X-rays that were given of her uh, proximal femur. Um, and so, and then the, her uh, full length. So she's been treated with a cephalomedullary troch entry nail. And uh, we can see some uh, evidence of her uh, deformity here. Um, if, would anybody like to contribute? You'll have to unmute your microphone or uh, send, um, send it by the chat uh, function, which I can't see now. What is the clinical exam? There's the <clears throat> chat window. Uh, yeah, so the, the clinical exam we're given is that she uh, has an in-towing gait, that she has pain uh, from the insertion side of her nail, uh, including her proximal femur, and she has knee pain as well. So it looks like we're gonna need a CT scan to check the pro uh, rotational profile. Mm -hmm. Sure, We'd, uh, with any complaint of intoning, we're gonna want that as well. What about the deformity that we can see on these views? I would think there's probably some extension at the, uh, at the old fracture site, right? Some flexion of the proximal fragment, just because we can see here along the anterior cortex of the residual femur there um, uh, in comparison to the, the proximal femur there. It may not be because we don't know what this looked like. This might've been an intercalary cortical fragment, but there's the possibility certainly. You can see how much posterior trochanter is visible behind the nail. Um, so there may be some flexion to it or uh, as you've suggested, we might have more of a rotational uh, deformity. And we don't know without seeing her x-rays of the other side, we don't know uh, her coronal plane uh, deformity, whether or not there is uh, some varus here in the proximal femur. Tim, you're going to keep an eye on that on the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you watch the chat. Yeah. All right, so uh, further studies. Uh, so some uh, we've, we've been asked for a rotational profile uh, CT of the proximal femur or of the femur compared to the other side. Uh, and what we can see here is that on her unaffected side, she has an 11 degrees of native uh, aniversion 
And uh, what's the deformity then if we compare that to her right side? Oh, it's written up there at the top, sorry. <laughs> So we're at uh, 23 degrees of excessive anti-torsion. Let's go back here. All right. And so that excessive anti-torsion in her femur is what's making her in tow, right? If you Think about, uh, think about her hip. If she wants to keep her hip in the same position, then her distal femur has been internally rotated. It, um, if she points her foot straight forward, then she's going to have that 24 degrees of excessive uh, antiversion at the, at the hip. Is there a scanogram to check the limb length discrepancy or from the CT scan? Yeah. There, there is indeed, in fact, and uh, that's an excellent uh, point. Not only can we get the lengths, but uh, we're going to be able to see what effect, if any, we have on the uh, mechanical axis as well. So here it looks like her length is uh, relatively well maintained, uh, and that also helps us to um, maybe, maybe think that we don't have a big coronal plane deformity as well, because if she was in a lot of uh, varus compared to her other side, she'd be quite a bit shorter. So, any thoughts? We're told she doesn't want a quote unquote big operation. Anybody want to? Contribute. So we have, uh, we think that we, we don't have a, a coronal plane. There may be a slight sagittal plane deformity, but we haven't uh, really investigated that uh, farther. So uh, what we're mostly dealing with, right, is this uh, 23 degree <coughs> rotational deformity of her proximal femur in the face of a cephalomedullary nail. Regarding that flexion of the proximal fragment, uh, do we have the range of motion, like flexion extension of the hip? Commonly, this is well tolerated, but I'm not sure in this case. Yeah, it's going to complicate the whole problem. But she doesn't. Uh, we're we're going to say that she does not have symptoms with uh, with hip flexion and rotation, uh, which would uh, impingement syndrome symptoms such as that would lead us toward considering correcting uh, sagittal plane deformity. Um, but uh, no, that's not a presenting complaint for her. So if we were going to address just her rotational deformity, uh, does anyone want to put together kind of a, a little bit of a preoperative plan for us? Obviously her implant has to come out. I mean, it looks like it's going to require a rotational correction through an osteotomy, mm -hmm. the location of the osteotomy would be the first thing to think about how yes. you want to do it. And the trajectory of the osteotomy, I think the simpler way to do a transverse osteotomy closer to the fracture site, uh, instead of recreating the old fracture, would be the much simpler way and possibility recovery wise a little easier to do that way. So at what level would you be considering performing the osteotomy? I mean ideally not to mess up the original insertions of the muscles would be better to do at the level of the fracture. So somewhere between the lesser troch and the distal extent of the fracture, I think, will be fine just below the lesser troch level, somewhere in the next like two inches level. So I think it will be. Osteotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What are your other options? I guess you can do it distally too, that I wouldn't recommend because I think it's more problematic and prone to problems and is far away from the fracture site. So this will kind of 
not ideal for the muscle trajectories, muscular tendinous units trajectories neither. Yeah, right. So that so if we consider that our, our origins of the muscles are maybe in their normal anatomic position, if we're going to create a new rotational deformity distal to that, we're going to give her sort of a Z-shaped muscle path, um, at least for a while. Uh, and of course, right, we have to remember that the the mechanical axis and the anatomic axis, right, are quite far apart proximally compared to how they are distally. And so if we had a deformity induced proximally and we correct it distally, um, we are, it, it's going to have potentially more of an effect of, of a secondary deformity than if we correct it closer to the site of the initial injury. We could also correct this in the inner trochanteric region. It looks like her lesser trochanter is healed to her proximal femur. Um, that's going to put us above probably the level of her initial deformity, and so maybe not uh, maybe not ideal for this case. We're going to try and avoid mid diaphyseal corrections, um, and uh, and then we talked about a distal metaphyseal correction. So. All right, so you're thinking uh, more of a subtrochanteric osteotomy and the obliquity of that osteotomy? I mean, that's the real question here, right? If you wanna make the femur more anatomic, you will kind of recreate the old fracture line, but it also make it harder in a malunion to re reconnect these two pieces. One, by the time you reconnect it, one is the hard, hard to plant that osteo osteotomy. Second, by the time you correct it, the opposition of the bone is going to be less, so the healing time is going to be much longer. And the, regardless what kind of fixation you put it in, it's not going to be as stable as a transverse osteotomy. Right. And so the advantages of a transverse osteotomy for a rotational correction are that you can rotate directly around through the osteotomy. Um, you don't create any further deformity. You can compress and um, have a very stable uh, osteotomy site that you can weight bear on immediately. If you need to correct a coronal plane or sagittal plane deformity in association with a large rotational correction, probably the easiest way to do it is to make your transverse osteotomy, correct your rotation, and then once your rotation is corrected, then remove an appropriate wedge uh, that would create a closing wedge correction in either your coronal or sagittal plane, depending upon the patient's residual deformity. Uh, all, all done at the same time, of course. But um, but but here we're really we're uh, sort of leading toward uh, ignoring any sagittal plane correction in favor of a pure rotational correction, and then, as you've said, um, a transverse osteotomy with rotation through the osteotomy is is really ideal. And then we'd like to select an implant which allows us to take advantage of that stable osteotomy. So um, any thoughts on uh, implant selection? Anybody else can feel free to, to chime in as well. Um, although Utku, you're doing a fantastic job. I mean, if you're gonna do a subtrug osteotomy, nail will be ideal choice for the recovery phase. That way you can let weight bear and it's much more stable as an intramedular device. So I will go with an intramedular device in this so case. Would you not let the patient weight bear on a transverse osteotomy that was fixed with a plate? I probably would if you compress it through an ATD. Definitely you can, but I guess the exposure will be much larger too. This will be the other thing, right? The surgical exposure uh, for an intramedular device versus an extramedular device is going to be different. So I would prefer if I can achieve the same things in this case that I think I can and probably mechanically much stronger regarding the fatigue failure ways in case the patient don't have a healing in a timely manner it's better to have an intermedial device than an extramedial device. Okay, so yeah, I, uh, with a plate and screws, uh, it certainly it would require a larger surgical exposure for the insertion of the screws. Of course, we're gonna have a surgical exposure because we have an osteotomy to be performed, but it would be 
more extensive for the plate fixation and the and the uh, compression uh, potentially. Um, the uh, and, and we also have a nail there that we have to remove. Uh, so we know we're already going to have an exposure up at the proximal portion of the femur for the for the nail removal uh, as well. And in fact, dependent upon where we plan our osteotomy, we might be able to utilize the fact that the uh, screw insertion or blade insertion um, uh, for this uh, previous implant, we're going to have to have a separate incision to remove that portion of this uh, implant uh, as well. So those are all things to take into consideration, but we also have to take into consideration if we are going to use an intramedullary implant, uh, are we going to attempt to achieve compression and how, or are we placing um, an implant across a neutralized or perhaps even slightly distracted transverse osteotomy if we do that? So. It, uh, we would want to think about are there ways to compress the osteotomy for when the nail is placed to make sure that we don't create a distraction uh, at the osteotomy site, which might uh, predispose to it not healing well. Other, uh, other thoughts? Um, anybody else wants to, to chime in? Dave? You're, you're popping up as the active speaker. Dave, Steven? Yeah. That, oh, that, sorry. I guess I should. I mean, it's attractive to use an iron nail because you're going to have the same incisions to take the nail out. Um, the other thing is that when you go to do the osteotomy, you're going to need rotational uh, guides. So you'll need, I made the mistake of using two millimeter K wires before, and they're kind of wimpy. And so um, something a little stronger, either you know, a uh, two or three millimeter uh, Steinman pin after you pre-drilled it. And then once a correction, one of the things I've started to do is use a little unicortical plate just to hold the correction because, uh, you know, it'll, it'll move around a little bit on you as you go to put the, the nail down. Um, so just a two seven unicortical plate, if the bone's big enough, maybe a three five, but a two seven is a nice way of holding the osteotomy in place while you do your definitive uh, stabilization. Now, if you want to use a plate, obviously that's a, a moot point, but I think a nails, a, an iron nails, a nice attractive thing to do. here. Yeah. I, I like that a lot because I've had the same problem uh, that you have where that you either knock one of your wires out or a wire gets bent. And uh, then you're questioning whether or not your rotational control is, uh, is exact. And um, so it's uh, it's nice to have it stabilized. Um, yeah, another technique obviously is you can put to, to you can put a clamp across the transverse fracture either through uh, two unicortical screws or even through cortical holes um, with a modified uh, pointed reduction forceps inserted into the two holes. But as you said, some way to maintain the um, uh, the position of the uh, osteotomy after the rotational correction. Uh, and then potentially you can also compress through one of those devices as well. The other thing is I, I take a saw and I score the lateral cortex uh, before I do the osteotomy. And obviously it's a little bit of a estimation, but in that way you get a sense afterwards that you've, whether it's a 20 degree, 20 degree correction, the, that line is not obviously congruent because uh, that can happen as well. So all those little guides to try and make sure you're getting the precise, as precise a correction as possible. So I'd ask, given, given this previous implant, if we were going to choose an intramedullary nail, would we choose a, a piriformis starting intramedullary nail or um, a similar nail uh, as, as this with a cephalomedullary entry point? Advantages. Probably, advantages. yeah. Go ahead. Probably using a piriformis nail will be problematic, right? So because it will probably fall into the tr track of the trunk nail, and it will push you in various create a problem. So it's better to use a trunk start nail. Okay. If you wanted to use a piriformis nail, any way that you could prevent that problem, which is an absolutely uh, um, an excellent concern. Is there any way to prevent that problem from happening? So if you could block the previous path, 
you can like allograft that might be nice. What's that, Chris? Uh, fibula allograft. Yeah, fibula allografts are a really nice option, right? Because it fits so nicely into the previous intermedullary path. Um, so that that's a really good option, and particularly if uh, if it. Um, if it doesn't then block the appropriate path for your piriformis nail, but that, that can work very well. Does it, I guess my question would be, depending on where the osteotomy is performed, do you, do you think it matters, you know, if you get below the bend of the nail, which may start becoming diaphyseal, is that, I mean, are, are you concerned that we're inducing another deformity because we're bending around a, or we're twisting around a bent nail or, is it more the concern of putting the nail back in and you know not being precise? Because her coronal plane alignment, I guess, looks like it's pretty good, right? We're just doing rotation. Correct. Yeah, and that's exactly the that's exactly the concern that I was getting at is that uh, if you're going to rotate around a nail which has an angulation to it, potentially you're going to end up with a gap. But of course, the that only happens if the nail is canal filling uh, and is impinging on the on the inside of the of the cortex so that it can create a deformity. Here, looking at this nail, it appears that there's plenty of room around the proximal femur, so that probably uh, wouldn't be so much of a problem, but, it, but it's always something to think about. If you're going to rotate around a nail um, and that nail has a bend in it, then you're gonna end up potentially with an angular deformity. Now, the, the technique that uh, Dave uh, Stephen was talking about of having a plate on there might potentially help prevent that as well. Uh, but really, it's going to be the mismatch between the size of the canal and the, the size of the nail at that bend and at the osteotomy. Um, but if this was a real tight uh, proximal femur, I would absolutely switch to a piriformis nail to prevent that problem from happening. Because as you said, Chris, if we, if we go to the straight part of this nail, we're probably almost mid-diaphyseal. Don't you think it matters a little bit on um where the osteotomy is done, how proximal though too. I mean, the more, the more uh, distal, uh, the more comfortable I am with a piriformis nail, uh, the more proximal it is, the more I feel like I need control of that proximal fragment a little bit. Um, it might be more willing to, to go to a cephalomedullary nail. Um, so why does the piriformis give you less control of the proximal segment? You mean just the interlocking options? Yeah. Um, just smaller fragment, uh, flexion extension. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a very valid, uh, issue. And certainly with, uh, the more proximal we are with the osteotomy, typically the wider the medullary canal and the less likely we are to see, uh, an angular deformity induced by rotating. So let's go, let's see what, uh, what was done here. So uh, does everybody, is, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this. This is an intermedullary osteotomy saw. Um, and so it, uh, it depended upon the company saw that you use. It typically requires you uh, to have a relatively large reamed intermedullary uh, canal. Um, and so in this case, it looks like the um, reamer irrigator aspirator was used to open the medullary canal. Um, potentially, that also harvested some uh, bone uh, from the medullary canal. Uh, and then the intramedullary saw can be placed. And what you see here is the, the wide part of the saw is centering um, the, the saw within the medullary canal. And then that uh, very small L-shaped piece sticking out is the actual blade. And you can see that it sticks out just a little further than the centralizing plug. Uh, and now you would rotate that around, scoring the endosteum, and then gradually um, use increasing size uh, until you can cut through a large portion of the cortex and then create a, a, a closed osteoclasis. So Mark, can I say uh, something? I, I think the site of the osteotomy is important here if you're using yeah. an iron saw, because if you go just about two centimeters proximal to that, you're gonna be in callus and perhaps that healed uh, segmental fracture fragments. So you have to be more in a cortical uh, situation. And I think maybe the R, the R, the reamer irrigator aspirate of the RIA was used because the canal is closed and the risk of fat emboli maybe. I don't know. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point, right? That, uh, that 
uh, although you do have a vent hole distally where the interlocking screw was, uh, but, um, but that's a long way away from where the osteotomy is being performed. Um, Good point though, uh, that Dave made in, um, you know, with the intramedullary saw, the, the, you know, if the uh, shaft is not uh, symmetrical, if you will, it's much harder to make that cut there. Uh, getting down out of that callus uh, so that it's more symmetrical, then you're just left with the posterior part of the cortex that hasn't cut all the way through and, and you can usually uh, crack that then. Yeah, and yeah, right, so, so it's, um, the femur is never a cylinder because we always have the linea aspera and that's always the portion of the femur that doesn't get cut by the intramedullary saw and that's the portion that has to be broken through. Uh, so they elected to do the osteotomy quite distal, just below the uh, all of the callus, which is pretty close to diaphys mid diaphyseal osteotomy. And then we can see here that in the previous uh, implant, the nail was running down the medial side of the uh, of the femur. And so uh, we have a shant pin in the distal femur, which presumably is to help with, uh, with the uh, rotational marking. And then we have some wires that are being used to block the old path of the nail so that the new path of the nail will be more aligned with the mechanical axis. Right, we can see on the left-hand view, there's a beaded wire there that uh, is in the old path. Those Kutchner awls are mandatory for trying to break through that old scar too. Yeah, good, good point, thank you. And so the transverse osteotomy was created by the intramedullary saw, similar devices used with a uh, cephalomedullary nail, probably the same blade path in the head and uh, neck fragment. Uh, as well as in the uh, trochanter. Uh, and because we're below the level of the bend of the nail, uh, we can rotate around that transverse osteotomy using, the, uh, using that implant. Um, Tim, what do you think the effect was of the new path in the distal femur? Um, I, I think it centered it uh, a little bit better. Uh, based on this view, uh, now we're we're more over on the lateral side, but um, I also think that uh, maybe we got a little bit better apposition uh, at our osteotomy side. Yeah, there was a deviation of our mechanical axis for sure, right? Um, so we're, we're through the maybe lateral side of the lateral tibial spine on her affected side. But I'm surprised that uh, with that correction that there wasn't uh, a gap induced with the new port, you know, with a new nail path only in the distal fragment, potentially. You'd yeah. expect that there's now, um, you know, a gap along the lateral cortex. It doesn't seem like that happened. Question. Based on how you angle your C-arm, though, you can eliminate some gaps. <laughs> yes. Question. Question. How you judge your correction intraop? How much to rotate? Yeah, so um, uh, Tim or, or Dave or uh, Chris, um, techniques that you like. Uh, uh, Dave, you talked about some with the, with the fracture open or using the wires, but other techniques to, to control and judge the degree of correction? In, in this situation, where we're using an intramedullary saw, I like the 2.5 chance pins or, you know, um, one above, one below. So I would probably, yeah, um, uh, that, that right there in the distal femur and one in the proximal femur, um, posterior to where where the uh, entry site is usually where you can get one. And then um, either uh, the triangles or a sterile goniometer uh, in the operating room uh, and be able to, you know, sight down the gun barrel, if you will, uh, once you rotate it, um, and you'll be within five degrees. 
Do you, uh, do you prefer to put your pins in parallel and then rotate to the degree of uh, correction or put them in at the degree of correction? I actually do both usually uh, in the distal fragment. So I'll put, I'll put them in uh, parallel, uh, but then in the distal fragment, I'll put a second pin in that is what my correction is. And so it's sort of a double check. Uh, when I rotate then, um, you know, the, the, other, the, the other set of pins now will be parallel. Uh, and that way, if one bends or one loosens during the case, I've got a backup. That's great. That's a great point. Because when you've got one pin in each fragment and you're trying to say put them in 20 degrees apart, there's a lot of sighting that has to, has to happen to get those pins. When, when both pins are in the same fragment, it's probably a lot easier to get that uh, angular um, correction between those two pins. One of the problems here is she's got a fairly large soft tissue envelope. So one of the problems I've had is doing that technique, I found that the wires can bend and maybe the two and a halfs won't bend as much. Certainly it looks like five millimeter pins were used here, but I, I just find with a bigger soft tissue envelope, I'm never really happy that I can read those perfectly. And, and so I, I'm gone to more making a direct approach to the osteotomy because you're gonna have to finish that off posteriorly anyway with your osteotome, respecting the biology, like you're not putting homans around the whole femur, so you're not disrupting the blood supply, but really limiting it to a lateral uh, view of the cortex. And again, using more local guide wires. And then I can use the osteotomy triangles that we've heard about in the previous uh, weeks. Uh, just to get more precise correction, because I don't want to come back. <laughs> mm -hmm. has, has anybody used the intraoperative uh, app for rotation? So you, you know you can you can use any of the carpentry um, apps that uh, that will show angles in space. You can put your iPhone into a into a sterile bag uh, and hold it up uh, adjacent to your pins. Um, and it'll, it will uh, tell you the, the correction between the two pins, as long as the leg doesn't rotate. Are, are you doing that? Yeah, Mark? yeah. yeah. Um, I think it, um, it's a, probably an annoying degree of accuracy, because uh, when, if I'm shooting for 20 degrees and I'm at 19.4, um, or actually 19.427, uh, it may be more information than I need. But, hey Mark, uh, but it is something that we all have access to. We're at uh, noon yeah. right now. All right, so rotational osteotomy summary, CT evaluation, best evaluation probably for torsion, but of course we are going to combine that with a physical examination for uh, uh, symptoms at the hip and the, the knee, and also to compare the rotational profile uh, on physical exam between the two limbs. Um, and, uh, that, and those should correlate, right? The imaging abnormality and the clinical rotational profile abnormality. Correction is best done at the deformity or malunion site if, if possible, or, or adjacent to a, uh, to a joint, so we could, this one could have been done adjacent to the hip at the intertrochanteric or high subtrochanteric uh, site. Uh, and then some type of a robust guide to your rotation uh, that will not bend or dislodge from the bone uh, during the rotational uh, correction, right? And the only comment uh, from the chat room was just uh, about retroversion, but I think we dealt with that by talking through the rotation. So, but feel free to to ask questions through the chat room too. But but also, you know, if you want to unmute your mic and speak up, that's uh, that's good as well. Yeah, we appreciate appreciate comments from uh, from everybody. So please. Feel free to participate. Uh, so this next case is a 29-year-old male involved in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, had this presenting uh, x-ray and was treated, uh, we're told, with an open reduction internal fixation. These are his films at uh, four months. Um, so 
we could obviously comment about the reduction, comment about the, uh, the internal fixation. Certainly the screws are uh, inadequately located to uh, best support the uh, femoral neck. Um, uh, although we do have screws along what was probably the posterior calcar, but of course we can see that the femoral head's not aligned to the posterior aspect of the, of the femoral neck. Uh, and the screws are all bunched together, uh, functioning almost like a, like a single screw. So um, here we go it, with his uh, AP pelvis x-ray to be able to compare to the contralateral side. We can see the shortening. We can see the coronal plane varus uh, deformity. And um, we don't have a measurement here of the offset, but it's uh, pretty clear looking at the relationship of the lesser trochanter to the ischium that the offset is significantly decreased. Okay. Fracture is ununited. We're going to assume the patient still has pain. There does appear to be a, a slight retro tilt to the epiphyseal segment in relation to the, uh, to the neck. Um, it's not measured here, but we'll say about perhaps 10 degrees. Uh, and the, the uh, femoral uh, head neck segment is, is translated posteriorly as well. So anybody want to take us through maybe our, the planning for this? Okay, good. There's the, there's the uh, information. So two, just over two centimeters of shortening, 120 degree CCD angle, but we're not told what the normal is. So, uh, we're going to say that's somewhere to 10 to 15, 15 degrees, and uh, the fracture is ununited. All right, I'm going to put up the participant list here. Look at all, look at all those people. All right, anybody want to um, jump in? Look, I even have the possibility to unmute you and make you jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Dave or Chris, I can definitely call on you guys because. Uh... Yeah, we've been, we've been identified. We're out of the anonymity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the combination of problems uh number one is the non-union uh and then i think potentially the you know the next biggest thing will be the correction to get um you know change your pal's angle to get uh, some healing uh isn't necessarily going to address the uh loss of offset um although i guess we can try to work in ways to make that happen but he's i mean he's, he's short between his trochanter and his uh, center of rotation. So uh, that will complicate things to some extent. Um, so what would you be shooting for with the Powell's angle here? I mean, I, I, we, don't have a, we don't have the measurement um, drawn out for us, but um, are, are you, um, you know, going with the traditional recommendations of trying to uh, make uh, the Powell's angle significantly horizontal or going more with the recommendation from the paper from Seattle uh, in terms of the correction? Yeah, I think that, that's a, um, certainly a, a, the citation that, you know, um, I kind of went back to after getting very aggressive uh, for the first couple that I did. Um, and uh, I think it was mentioned in the first session uh, a, a couple weeks ago is, you know, maybe not trying to achieve a 25 degree angle is, um, or sorry, trying to achieve uh, restoration of anatomy is probably good enough and not trying to go extreme to the 25 degree angle um, as was kind of classically taught because of the risk of AVN, but also this is also ends up becoming a, uh, you know, a, a new deformity induced. So I don't think it would be, you know, if, if eyeballing that, maybe that's uh, 60 degrees. I don't think it would be that excessive. A, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to turn this into a uh, very, very big correction. I think it would be more along the lines of, like you said, presuming 
uh, if 120 degrees is the CCD on the affected side and you know, at best 135 is the opposite side, it would be a, a smaller correction in that regard in the coronal plane. Yeah, because uh, boy, we used to stand people up a, a long way. We used to put them really in a lot of valgus uh, in order to, um, to, to give them a, a Powell's angle. Uh, that was horizontal and um, and and then you had to take their deformity down in some cases afterwards and set them back to a more normal anatomy because you created so much valgus in the proximal femur um, and also uh, you know obviously increased risk of avascular necrosis and tensioned the heck out of their abductors and sometimes gave them an abduction contraction so we're looking for what what kind of a correction here chris you think uh, uh valgus uh producing osteotomy uh is that what you're getting at yeah do you think uh, that you would be uh, attempting to correct uh the you know what we saw here on the ct scan of perhaps a 10 degree retro tilt yeah i think that i mean uh, it was an interesting point made in the um uh kind of main discussion earlier and uh was something i was going to ask about um you know i've taken Kind of the approach of pushing a little bit and trying to wire the you know the greater trochanter to the head in a way that I think is corrected that to some extent but but you know sometimes that moves still enough in the um, axial plane or sagittal plane um, but maybe it doesn't always and so then you know it, it becomes a, a kind of a complicating set of uh, you know plans around the osteotomy but I've I guess I've just tried to correct it a little bit with, uh, you know, maybe percutaneous or, or closed methods and trying to wire the head and the, and the trochanter together. Maybe I've just been um, given really badly unstable ones so far. And it seems to be, that, that would be my approach. I'm not sure I would go <clears throat> into the hip itself to correct that. But then if you don't correct that uh, retroversion, it complicates the planning for the osteotomy. And that's got to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Mark, I think you made the point when you gave your talk a couple of weeks ago, or maybe that was last weekend, I can't remember, um, that if you, you're you kind of getting into the biplanar modality of the osteotomy and then your ability to compress goes down. So right. it becomes a bit more complicated uh, as far as the correction goes. Right. You know, if you're going to try and correct that retro tilt by uh, inducing a little rotation here, for instance, uh, through our osteotomy, that forces us to have a perpendicular osteotomy to the shaft of the femur and uh, in doing so then we lose significant opportunities for offset compression and for lateralization of the of the shaft which um, may push you yeah, and we don't but, regain length as much which may bring you to using a 95 as opposed to 110 if you want a 20 de 20 degree correction right you might then, yeah. then you can get more of a direct compression right or so, a 90 or a 90 yeah 90 yeah sorry 90 whatever yeah. um yeah, and, you know, I think the fact that he's got kind of that non-union situation, you're probably, in addition to the blade, perhaps an additional uh, cancellous screw above the blade or at some point just to try and get some compression. But certainly you're going to have to hold that interoperatively, uh, either with K-wires, as Chris alluded to, or, or probably just K-wires initially and then think about a screw afterwards just to compress it. Yeah, the... Um it's been my experience that the the ones you were talking about, Chris, the grossly mobile non-unions, the ones that if you don't pin, I mean, the ones that you could almost, if you wanted to, you could correct some deformity and pin, uh, or if you pulled the hardware out and then tried to pin them, you'd almost have to sort of realign them. My success rate of osteotomies in those has been significantly uh, more poor than in the real stiff non-unions where you almost don't have to to wire them at all. You could insert your uh, your blade. Um, without the head changing position to the to the uh, proximal femur, so we'd be planning. It sounds like for an abduction osteotomy, we're keeping in mind that uh, retro tilt, um, but we we want to uh, reestablish the length, um, give a hopefully a more uh, anatomic position of the proximal femur. Um, I would. I'd assess what happened to the Powell's angle. In this case, it's going to, it's probably going to be acceptable, but if we had a very, very vertical non-union, um, 
maybe an anatomic reduction doesn't doesn't give us, uh, or an anatomic uh, repositioning of the femur doesn't give us um, as horizontal an osteotomy as we would we would prefer. So here's the preoperative plan. We can see the uh, implant defect, the position of the blade has to be very low in the head below that, uh, below the uh, implant. Um, would anybody fill the, uh, fill the old screw tracks if possible? And if so, with what? Injectable or allograft? Or? I think I would, and it, I mean, I, I've, um... Can't tell us allograft that's packed really well. The problem is um, the holes for the cannulated screws aren't that big, so you potentially are making a, you know, widening a hole in the lateral cortex, which may complicate the um, uh, blade path and, and fixation uh, later. Uh, I haven't tried injectables um, in situations where it was previously fixed with a cephalomedullary nail. The hole is already bigger and. Uh, that's that makes passing allograft of various sorts quite a bit easier and then I've thought about getting into the other stranger mixes the moldable type situations but I haven't done that yet yeah but, I think those are those are really good points Chris that uh, if you've had a some type of a uh, screw construct in the and the, you know it's like a sliding hip screw or something uh, you've, you've got a much easier um, uh, track to to graft um, Steve Sims, I know, has a good has some good arthroscopy pictures of uh, injecting um, uh, cement into uh, cannulated screw paths, not knowing that the previous surgeon violated the articular surface of the head with the uh, wires, and um, so the uh, injectable ended up as an arthrogram, um, which is uh, probably a long day. Uh, so yeah, I've, uh, I, I think I, the same thing is that for cannulated screw paths, I haven't really found a, a, a good solution. Uh, so uh, we're planning here for a, a 20 degree correction with a 110 degree implant, right? So 110 degree uh, blade will give us a 20 degree correction if that blade is put in perpendicular to the shaft of the femur. And uh, just reading through, right? So it looks like uh, create part of the uh, osteotomy, um, insert the, the blade, finish the osteotomy, uh, and then um, create the uh, offset compression. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much of a triangle is being uh, taken out there. It looks to be less than halfway across the, uh, the femur. That's probably going to give less than a full two centimeter correction, but um, uh, I don't, you know, we don't have that, that information here. So they've measured the distance from the blade insertion site to the osteotomy. It's 17 millimeters from the blade to the osteotomy with a, um, yeah, with the insertion site. Tim, does that worry you at all? 17 millimeters between the insertion site for the chisel? and the uh, osteotomy site? Yeah, it's getting small, um, getting pretty close. I'm kind of a two centimeter fan myself. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the trouble is, is as you move more, more proximal or farther away from the osteotomy, you're getting closer where those screw tracks were, and maybe that's what the thinking was. Oh, you're right. You know the dotted lines there. That's not the that's not the resection. That's the that's the old implant path that we're that we're being shown. That, oh, right. That, but um, but yeah, that's a right. So the 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 concern is if the blade insertion site is too close to the uh, osteotomy, then as we tension it and uh, um uh and bring this down into valgus, it can break or crush the proximal femur. The the blade can actually move in the proximal femur into the osteotomy site, or you can just lose some of your uh, correction, neither one of which is, uh, is ideal. All right, so this is a different osteotomy configuration than we've seen with the pure uh, closing wedges, right? So it, the, with the with the closing wedge osteotomies that, uh, that we've been seeing, um, you get your length obviously through inducing the, the valgus, um, 
but the, the, the predominant uh, determination of length is going to be how far across the femur you cut the triangle, right? If you, if you make a pure closing wedge osteotomy, that is that the, the uh, osteotomy triangle exits at the same point as this transverse limb, uh, that will give you almost no lengthening. And if you take a, 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 a triangle that doesn't extend very far across the femur, that maximizes your lengthening, but it uh, decreases the um, degree of contact between the two fragments. Um, we also are typically planning so that the osteotomy ends up obliquely so that we can create a situation for um, uh, offset compression uh, through the osteotomy. Um, this uh, technique is to um, offset the, um, to basically create a transverse osteotomy and then translate the, the shaft laterally and then impale the proximal segment uh, into the um, uh, distal segment, into the medullary canal of the distal segment, uh, and then uh, compress it, not through um, offset compression, but through axial compression with an articulated tensioning device. And the advantage of this is that it maximizes your length restoration. Um, in doing so, because you because you haven't actually removed any of the proximal femur. Uh, however, the length restoration is going to be determined also by how much compression you get. And so, as you compress this with the articulated tensioning device, it's going to continue to shorten as the proximal segment invaginates into the distal segment. And so, you know, you you. It, it looks nice on the template there with a few millimeters of, um, you know, of, of impaction basically of the proximal fragment into the distal fragment, but I don't know the, how, you, how you control that um, because it just keeps going in until it stops, until the blade hits the, the lateral shoulder of the proximal fragment here. Thoughts, Tim? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's harder to control. Um, you know, if you're if you're loading onto cortical bone, uh, you have a little bit better chance of uh, ending up with what you planned uh, before starting the procedure. So, the other thing is that this uh, requires uh, quite a bit of unsupported blade uh, sticking out from the lateral femur in order to get that um, that much uh, lateralization. Um, but um, you know that's okay. This this area can be grafted in under here, um, but it's uh, it's uh, something to consider. Mark, would you say that there's lateralization of the shaft too, which uh, may make it more difficult down the road for our yeah. So right, if we look at the piriformis fossa and we kind of look here, it it doesn't look terrible. But uh, certainly the relationship of the trochanter to the shaft is going to be altered here. Now this may have in, this may have created the appropriate offset for the patient's anatomy uh, out of this. But um, but yeah, this is going to set you up for a problem. If you really felt that this was the best osteotomy to restore the head to shaft relationship, then I think there could be some consideration to taking the trochanter off and lateralizing the trochanter out here with a block of allograft intercalary between the fragments so that the relationship of the trochanter to the shaft to the head um, is, is maintained. Um, you know, Chris, Chris mentioned that, that that offset, that relationship between the trochanter and the head is significantly shortened in this particular case. And so uh, that would be one way to potentially get that back, but adds a, a lot of complexity to the osteotomy. So it looks like they uh, took the opportunity to add an additional screw here, to add an additional screw there, maybe because of the, the mobility of the, of the non-union. Not, uh, not uh, certain. Um, looks like there probably was some uh, invagination in here. Uh, but I think now you can clearly see what uh, Dave Stephen was pointing out, which is that the alignment of the medullary canal. But, well, before I keep doing this, can everybody see the mouse moving? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was just on my screen. Um, yeah, but the alignment of the medullary canal is sort of here uh, over the over a portion of the of the trochanter, and uh, so it might complicate uh, potentially complicate uh, a later arthroplasty, which is not something that we want to do. Ideally, we'd like to restore the anatomy of the proximal. 
Still looks kind of short, no? Like a centimeter or so? It does, doesn't it? Yeah, so lesser here. So it looks like the length restoration wasn't as much as, uh, as um, could hope for. Um, trochanteric height uh, looks reasonable, but yeah, but we still have that significant offset difference here, right, between the head and the and the trochanter, and that's where real reestablishing the more lateralized trochanter would have given better abductor function uh, and also prevented uh, later deformity issues. Next slide shows a yeah. There we go. Sorry, Tim. Nothing. Is that what you're talking about, the line, the shortening? Yeah, the line there. Okay. So it matched up reasonably well with the, with the plan. Uh, and here's the patient at uh, six weeks and at three months. And it looks like uh, it has been effective in healing the non-union of the femoral neck and certainly the osteotomy. Um, will heal quite quickly that you know this this portion of the osteotomy will heal incredibly rapidly while you're closing the wound uh, this portion of the osteotomy uh, will take a while to fill in but um, you can see at three months it's already um, already done very very well and the patient at two years So um, valgus osteotomy, uh, abduction osteotomy for uh, femoral neck non-union, it can be quite effective uh, in achieving union and also achieving union at the osteotomy site. Um, this, is, uh, this is one technique of making a limb perpendicular to the long axis of the femur. I think we typically do that anyway when we're removing um, a, a, a portion of the proximal femur, uh, but this makes, um, you know, in your planning, your compression of this osteotomy is different. This is going to be compression with a articulated tensioning device as opposed to the offset compression that we've seen um, presented in previous abduction cases. So there's no questions uh, on the chat line. Uh, we've got about uh, eight minutes for this last one. Should we put a, should we go to a different case? Um, uh, let's see. That one, that one we won't get through. All right. Keep this one up. I think we stay with the next one. Sounds good. 79 year old, uh, one year after a fracture of the proximal femur. Her main complaints, or his main, I'm not sure, uh, short, shortening of the limb, weakness, uh, presumably in the abductors, difficulty ambulating. So, somebody want to make comments about the deformity? Got about seven minutes, so obviously we're not given a full set of uh, information, but we can see that we have a significant sagittal plane deformity with flexion of the proximal fragment in relation to the shaft of the femur. Uh, implant insertion path was probably suboptimal, reduction was suboptimal, and then we have a coronal plane component to our deformity as well, right, with a it's a little bit tough to tell because this trochanteric fragment was probably a separate fragment, but it appears to be uh, a significant uh, abduction of the proximal fragment with a resultant uh, varus deformity. And that's what we would expect with this fracture uh, treated with a, a nail, right, is that we would have uh, an abduction flexion and external rotation of the proximal fragment. Um, it, you know, most, most common deformity that we would see here. So if we wanted to uh, correct this deformity, and obviously we could go down the discussion of a 79-year-old and what would be a reliable means of, uh, uh, you know, of, of reestablishing length and giving her back better um, abductor strength. But um, 
if we were going to correct this deformity through an osteotomy, where would we want to place the osteotomy? How would we gain our correction? What would we be considering for our implant selection? I mean, you have to go to the fracture side, old fracture side to the osteotomy for sure. Okay. And are you, so when you say the old fracture site, are you going to try and create an osteotomy down here at, at the most distal part, or are you going to try and recreate the patient's fracture of the proximal femur? That will be the real question, which one you want to do. I will probably go through the old fracture line, because if you just do a transverse osteotomy, I don't know, it looks like once you correct the sagittal alignment, then your implant placement is gonna be, may get harder. I think it's doable, but may get harder. I may try to create an oblique osteotomy in this mm -hmm. first X-ray plane. So I something like, will... something along this line? Yes. Okay. And then just imagine now with this, with this osteotomy, if we bring this and correct this sagittal plane deformity, what kind of bone contact are we gonna have? Because in the distal fragment, we're now gonna have an osteotomy like this, and in this fragment, it's gonna be this surface that we wanna hopefully reduce. So you're gonna end up with sort of point contact here anteriorly, and then a gap, a big triangular gap posteriorly. Yes, this is the downside of having that oblique osteotomy, but that way, actually, you can gain some length if the length was the issue. You'll gain length at, at the expense of a, of a posterior defect, yes. Another option would be, right, is that imagine this surface is gonna be reduced if we were able to, if we cut this way, then we could reduce this surface to this, but that is gonna result in, in shortening because we're losing the opportunity for all of this. Uh, this would be a somewhat difficult thing to machine, but if you went this way, you would then have two flat surfaces that you could potentially compress anteriorly and a defect posteriorly. That's a, a sagittal plane. What about the correction in the coronal plane? Right, because we can see that we have a significant varus here. And so if we created a plane of, of osteotomy only like this, then when we correct the coronal plane deformity, now we're almost gonna have point contact at our osteotomy site anterolaterally. And that's probably not ideal. We're gonna quickly run out of time here. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll look and we'll see that, uh, sorry, Tim? Yeah, three minutes. Okay, so uh, we can just, see- just so, that, just so that they can see what ended up happening. Right, yeah. So uh, the planning includes comparing the uh, anatomic axis of the normal femur to the anatomic axis now of the deformed proximal femur. Um, and, uh, but as, as you were said, uh, recreating the patient's fracture site with an osteotomy through the old fracture and then correcting the varus and correcting the flexion of the proximal fragment. Uh, so this, in this particular case, we're told there was no malrotation, uh, but then the leg length discrepancy. So the nail was removed. Uh, the rhea passed down the path to uh, remove some graft uh, and an oblique osteotomy done at the fracture site uh, with plate fixation planned. So there's our uh, rhea. Uh, and we can see here, uh, presumably this wire here is demonstrating the, oops, sorry, the plane of the uh, osteotomy uh, as well as the, the clamp here. And so we're playing here, we can see the osteotomy has been created uh, obliquely here uh, at the site of the old deformity. And then uh, in order to maintain that, so the osteotomy is reduced, we've got bone contact anteriorly, uh, a small push plate has been placed uh, to push down on the proximal fragment here uh, to control 
deflection. So we've got the proximal fragment trapped underneath the plate here, and then this is secured into the distal fragment uh, while the uh, definitive implant is being applied. It's difficult for us to see, but we can presume that there is some, some degree of defect posteriorly. And so uh, the uh, anti-glide uh, plate uh, pushing down on the proximal fragment has been uh, maintained. Uh, and you can see that there has been a uh, allograft insertion here into the tract of the proximal segment. It looks like it probably was a fibula. Uh, and that might have also guided the uh, choice of uh, implant uh, here, which is a proximal femoral locked implant with screw fixation into the proximal segment. And so we have a correction of the largely of the um, the uh, sagittal plane deformity and uh, coronal plane deformity through that uh, oblique osteotomy. So that by restoring the patient's uh, anatomy, we restore the patient's mechanics, improve the leg length, and improve the abductor function. We're about to be kicked back to the main group. So I hope uh, everybody was able to get something out of the small group discussions, and thanks for participating either vocally or in your heads. Absolutely, thanks. Is required. Um, and then proximal femoral osteotomies uh, affect extra articular alignment, including the mechanical access. So when you're doing proximal femoral osteotomies, you have to be very mindful. And we, and we talked a lot in our group about making sure you get an extremity alignment series uh, to look at what the overall effect on the limb's going to be. Because um, like some of us mentioned, like you do a valgus osteotomy on the proximal femur, the patient had a valgus knee to begin with and you just made a, that knee problem worse. So uh, you just have to be really mindful of what your effect is doing to the rest of the limb uh, alignment and mechanical access. Uh, so just remember, join us for Thursday is the discussion group Meet the Experts. So we want you to send in your proximal femur cases uh, it will be, ju you'll just hear us uh, talking if, um, if uh, you don't. So send us your cases and we'll work through the, them together. The faculty are going to present your cases just to make it smoother for them. Um, this is how you get the cases to us. Um, so you got this email blast and you'll get another one on Monday. So you'll send your cases to webmaster at aona.org. Uh, and that these are the things that you need to include, the patient history, preoperative deformity evaluation. And really, uh, if you can add any physical exam details, that's super helpful. Any intraoperative imaging and photos, postoperative imaging and uh, healed imaging with clinical photos if possible. And just remember, don't include any protected health information. You also see that the email blast has the way to register a little bit different. Um, and so this blue bar on the email blast uh, takes you to the uh, web page that has all of the uh, course on it. Um, the other way to get there is if you go to the aona.org uh, webpage, you'll see this in the, the banner. The Osteotomy Weekly will come up. If you click on Learn More, that'll take you to this page. Um, this is, if you click on the email blast, that blue tab, um, that will take you here as well. Um, and so the ones that have already happened, so the previous weeks will come up as YouTube links and take you to that entire session. And so Mike Serkin has spent hours and hours every week segmenting the overall session into the smaller lectures. Or, or parts of the uh, session, so you don't have to watch an hour and a half to get to one part of it. Um, all of them are breaking up, broken up into like less than 20 minute sessions, and so he's done a ton of work with that. But for the, um, for the events that haven't happened, you will be, uh, when you click on that week, it'll take you to register, and, and we understand that it's a complete pain to have to register every week, but the way that it works is that the Zoom links have to be have to have your specific uh, identifier on it so you can get CME credit. Um, you can't get, at least right now, you can't get CME credit for the past events that you missed that you didn't register for. But like I said, you can go back and look at the YouTube links, and this is all on the same page now. So um, the 
great thing about starting out with something new is that you have lots of opportunity to make things better as time goes on. So we definitely want your feedback as well. And we'll try to make the links that you get uh, easier to uh, navigate, but we're trying to do that every week. So again, be, uh, be patient. Um, this is a, a big change for um, how we're delivering education. So try to be patient with us. You should get a Zoom link if you registered. So if you're on today, you will get a link tomorrow to the recorded sessions. So it may not be your discussion group, but if you want to hear how other folks work through the cases, um, there are three recorded sessions and you'll get a link to those tomorrow. I'm not sure if it'll be all three, but you'll, you will get the link. And again, if you are like, hey, this session was so awesome, uh, but it was too fast for me, or hey, I missed one from last week, uh, the uh, YouTube channel has the entire course like this. This session won't be available till probably Tuesday because of the amount of time that it takes to uh, edit. Um, so just try to be patient with that, but you will have the Zoom link tomorrow. Uh, but if you go to the AO Trauma North America, uh, you have to go through the, if you've never been there before, you have to go through the AO North America channel, um, and then you can either subscribe to AO North America channel, which is up on the right hand side, or you can go to the different channels if, if, and just try to work through it on YouTube. It's not that difficult. And then once you get there, you can search AO Trauma North America and then get delivered right there. And the playlist is for the osteotomy course, and you can see all of the past sessions that are uploaded.